Hi, my name is Joshua Harper, and I'll be the conductor of this weekend's concert, Brahms Requiem. And I am thrilled to be chatting, hanging out with my esteemed colleague, Maria Fleury, who will be playing timpani on the Brahms this weekend. Um, this is a reduced orchestration that we'll be performing by Johann Linkelmann. And one of the things when I first heard about this reduced orchestration, in my mind, I said, there's plenty of room for reduction, but if there's no timpani, there's absolutely no way this works. <laughs> and luckily, when we looked at the score, immediately, there's the timpani line, completely unaltered from the full score, thankfully. So here we are. That was the first thing I said to Henry. <laughs> cool, is there a timpani part? <laughs> yeah, you, can't, you cannot perform Brahms Requiem without timpani. And so I was, yeah, really glad that it's there. And I'm curious uh, to hear your thoughts on why it has to be there. And we'll obviously hear some of my thoughts about why it has to be there. The timpani is not involved in every movement, um, even in Brahms' original orchestration. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the reduction works so well, is oftentimes Brahms simply did not include certain instruments. In his original orchestration, the first violins are nowhere to be found in the entire first movement. However, the placement of the timpani is so specific and so particular. And so before I show my cards in my hand, I'm curious, I, I know you've written a little bit about it, but explain to us in your mind, what does the timpani represent, both within Brahms' music in a larger context, and especially here in the Requiem? Um, I think I would have to say, in the larger context, I'd have to say that um, the first timpani part of Brahms that I studied was his first symphony. And um, there are a lot of rhythmic things, you know, from repercussions, you know, if, if we're talking about, like, going into layers. I start with rhythm, and I started well. Okay, so these this is the these are the notes because timpani plays specific pitches, and then I went oh well okay so there are some colors, and then I said, oh but what note of the chord am I playing? Oh but what is this chord? Well, why is this chord? Why is it a minor chord? But but wait a minute, there's it's a minor seven, but there's no five, and what's going on? So I started to analyze it, which was, was tough because I was still an undergrad and I hadn't had that much experience <laughs> score reading and trying to analyze it. But I set myself the task of, un task of understanding as much as I could the harmonic um, progression and what he's trying to do. Well, Brahms has this fabulous way of omitting certain pitches of a chord so that it slithers in and you think you're going somewhere, but you're not. And then it just keeps going. It's like... Um, it's, it's, uh, it is, it's just forward moving. It's just forward flowing. And so in the Requiem, it's, um, it's, it's a comfort. And from my interpretation of it is that he, he did it in a, in a way to comfort himself for some of the things that were happening in his life. Yes. And so it's, it's, it's like a, um, it's like a mattress. You know those lovely mattress toppers now? Oh, yes. Holy cow. And like, yeah, right, that and a lovely, lovely, maybe a heating blanket and a, and a uh, cover, uh, duvet. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that's what, you're, that's what you're easing into. He's just taking such good care of you harmonically, and the melodies are just, they just go on and on. So the timpani are there to, um, because of their velvet tone, they're, they blend perfectly into this, but then the rhythm just keeps the whole thing moving forward. Instead of, you know, there's, there's not, there are certain times in Wagner that you really need a little extra timpani because you're sitting in the audience going, I think I'm sinking. <laughs> okay, that was enough of mine. How about you? Well, I first just want to comment on that because I love that, and I don't know that that is maybe how I've thought about it, which is why I love talking to all musicians, because we, especially those who play the single part. As a conductor, I think about the single lines, but also the amalgam of those, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, that's so interesting, because this is a human requiem. This is a requiem that is, of course, mourning those who have passed, but also trying to bring comfort to the living. This is one of the really unique things about Brahms' Requiem. Obviously, Brahms has been affected by Schumann's death 
at this point, and then most recently for him, his mother's death, who he was very close to. And that's where this idea of comfort and blessedness is totally enveloped in this work. It's completely symmetrical, seven movements, and right at the heart is the blessedness and the comfort, yeah. right in the middle. Um, and especially the fifth movement where there's the soprano solo with many saying, even Clara Schumann, I think that was meant to represent his mother. And so to add another layer of comfort in the sense that yes, the velvet, warm, rich ta uh, tones of the timpani absolutely are embedded within that, I think is really special and really neat. And now I'm gonna go revisit the entire timpani line. So that, that's really exciting <laughs> and great. Um, for me, the timpani also represents kind of two characters in this work. Um, the second movement is a funeral march. It's in many ways kind of the darkest movement. I said it's a, a mirror image, and it's we do start with some sadness and with some grief. In the middle, we are comforted. And then in the end, we're almost, especially the sixth movement, challenging death, saying, where is your sting? Do you really, are, is this grief going to be all I have? And of course, the answer is no, it's not, because I will celebrate those who have gone before me and celebrate my life, right? And so in the second movement, when we first find the timpani, I, I think of it almost as a representation of death initially, mm -hmm. because it's always coming in the bum, 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 two, jump, bum, bum, bum. It's, it's this death march, that's what two is. And when the timpani comes in and then you add in the double mallet, the fifths, mm -hmm. Um, it's just you feel death creeping closer, you feel the grief creeping closer. Um, the second movement and the use of the timpani in some ways is, is the scariest moment for me in many ways. You feel death at, at your doorstep. Ab absolutely, and of course the, that, that four note motive, ba, 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 you've got Beethoven's fifth, Right. you, you have um, Liszt, um, uh, Beethoven motive, um, so that that four motive, four beat motive is um, a four note motive is it's prevalent all the way through the second half of, of the 1800s. Right, but then you get to the timpani helping right in the sixth movement of then fighting death. Yeah. Right, and that's where it's just I feel like the timpani is not death itself, but through the transformation of this warm comfort middle fourth and fifth movements, then we are actually taking maybe that fear which is in the second movement and then in the sixth movement saying, no, instead we're facing death. Mm -hmm. We're asking death, where's your sting? Hell, where is your victory? Mm -hmm. And now the timpani is on our side. And now the timpani is this character because the other thing you can think of the timpani is a heartbeat, yeah. right? And that's where it could be death in the second movement, but it also could be that heartbeat that although it is slow and pulsing, we are still here, mm -hmm. right? And then all of a sudden it's so, the timpani is so engaged in the final movements um, we're alive. It's very solid. Yeah, absolutely. And because the first movement is, it's a triplet figure, one, one triplet, or three triplet, one, but it's also in three, four. Right. And so it, it just, because it ends up, um, because it's the last beat of the measure into the next downbeat, it's just this constant flowing forward. And it's like life, your fate, your lives, we're all going to die, y'all. Um, but, but hang in there, folks. We're going to talk about this some more, and it's going to be, it's going to be okay. Yeah. Um, and so it's, um, I've played some very it's not going to be okay kind of music. No, this one is so much more, it's so much more uh, uh, about my approach to life, which is, yeah, terrible things happen. Uh, I'm here with you through it. Um, there, there will probably be some silver linings and maybe some gallows humor, um, but, but we're going to go through this and go forward. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's why I think the timpani is so essential and why you, there's, there's no other instrument that can replicate this, mm -hmm. right? In this reduced orchestration, there's not a harp, whereas there is in the original, but you'll hear the pizzicato of the strings, you know, represented in a similar way, or even the, the gentle tugging of the clarinet in order to represent that. What else can represent what we've just talked about mm -hmm. other than the timpani? Nothing, and that's why it's, it's such an important part of this orchestral texture. Yeah, and you talked about a really important part of this piece is uh, the big word 
hypermetrical dissonance that is also added in with the textual dissonance that I definitely didn't write a paper on in my master's degree. No way. Um, but it's so interesting how the level of rhythm, which is obviously a percussion and um, section is all about rhythm, but also the fact that we use timpani, which has pitch. And that's why I love that the only percussion instrument in this work, no matter the orchestration, is the pitched timpani. Because it is so much about these layers in the way that um, in the beginning, it can feel so unsettled with the triplets and the hemiolas and the meter, but then we get to the end and we get to these final fugues, and again, there's this assurance. There's a, there's a solemnity, but there's a solidity that we find, and the timpani just plays a huge role in that, and it's, it's so exciting. Can we go to rehearsal? I'm ready. Let's go. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's do this. Let's do this. So, um, I have a couple questions for you. Okay. First of all, a requiem, maybe some people don't know, is that it's actually a mass for the dead. And I mean, originally started in the Catholic Church and then progressed right into the um, Protestant religion. Uh, but, and it has, you know, the Kyrie and all the, the Latin text in it. Now, why do you think he chose to leave the Latin behind and choose the German for it to sing it in? Yeah, this is a really great question. And one of the reasons I know I love this Requiem so much, in fact, one of the mezzo-sopranos, Hannah, posted this weekend, she goes, I can't wait to sing my favorite Requiem this weekend. I think the answer to this question is why it is so many people's artists' favorite Requiem. Yeah. And it's because it is a human Requiem. It's not liturgical. Um, the Requiem is liturgical, you're right, it comes from the church. But one of the biggest departures and ways that we know that Brahms meant this is he puts it into the common tongue, right? He puts it into German in a way because people weren't fluent in Latin, not everyone in the 19th century, you know? And so they would go to these masses and they would know that it was solemn, but they didn't understand what they were memorializing, mm -hmm. right? And Brahms, he says, he's on record saying, you know, the title of the piece is Ein Deutsches Requiem, a German Requiem, but he just as easily could have called it a human Requiem. And that's really more what the piece is, is a human Requiem. And what he wanted to do was exactly what we've discussed before, is bring comfort to the living, right? The dead, we need to memorialize, we need to respect, we need to pay homage to, but they've passed on. Yeah. Those of us in that service, what about us? How do we go on? What do we need in order to grieve? And that's the question I think Brahms is answering by not only putting the text in German, but actually completely abandoning the Requiem text. Right. All of this text is an original amalgam by Brahms. And although I think he said, you know, this is a piece of art that I'm wanting to create for other people, I think it's just exactly what he needed too. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Now, um, so yeah, all the text is still from the Bible, but he, I mean, in, in one movement, he'll choose from three different, I mean, completely different parts of the Bible. Um, so was Brahms spiritual? No, not at this point in his life. He was raised, uh, I mean, in German, Germany at this time, you can really get away, especially from the Lutheran tradition. So he knows it well. He knows Bach's works very well. Very well. He has a Huge. deep respect for Bach. Right and Bach was extremely religious. Right. And so I don't think you can engage with Bach and have respect for Bach and not be like, I respect your religion. I respect your spiritual beliefs. Um, but in the same way that Messiah is a complete amalgam of texts from all over the Bible, the German Requiem is actually right there next to it as far as just brilliant text. Yeah. And Handel didn't, didn't create the libretto for Messiah, and that's what's so important. Brahms created the libretto mm -hmm. for the German Requiem. And again, he's picking and pulling from different parts of the Bible and the Apocrypha in a way to just get his message across. Because he is combining texts that maybe you're like, do those go together? You know, does, does Revelation go with Isaiah? <laughs> you know, but there's a way that you can pick and choose and then craft the message that again is very human. That no matter what your spiritual belief, we are all dealing with the existential question of death. Yeah. We all mourn and grieve and also will die. And so Brahms is taking you know, a religious text, which is the Requiem as religious text. He's still using religious text, but he's reconfiguring, 
pulling from new sources and bringing about a message that no matter, I believe, what your spiritual belief is, you can find your seven stages of grief in these seven movements. That's, that's interesting. That's interesting, right? Yeah. And of course, it's seven, which is, you know, a, a very across, a, I think a couple different religions is, a, is an important number. Three is an important number. Nine is an important number. So he has the triplets over three, which is a very Bach kind of thing to do. Yes. Um, so I do want to, just talk to, uh, to the text a little bit more. I, as a, as a timpanist, this is my fourth, maybe fifth time playing this work. And so, as, a, as you've already figured out, there's a lot to figure out. Um, but this is the first time that I've really taken the text and tried to match it up to my part. Great. And what's going on. And I'm really struggling with it. So I encourage you guys to look at the text beforehand because um, the translation I have is, is very old, oldest English. Oldest English. <laughs> so, um, so maybe you can help me with the struggle there. Um, but uh, so now, now I understand there's a very uh, adept English translation. Now, why did you choose the German instead of the instead of the English here in the United States? A lot of you can do it in English, absolutely. And and a lot of what Brahms has talked about the work being something that people can hear and relate and have accessible. There is a good reason for it. Um, I will say my personal reason for not choosing English is I don't find. I haven't found an English translation that I think is as powerful as the German text. Translations are exactly that, they're translations. Sometimes they are bad translations. And one of the things I would love to see in my lifetime is someone make a really wonderful um, English translation of this work. I don't think that it quite exists yet. And I think one of the powerful parts of this piece is how he uses the German sounds. Right. We get to the sixth movement when we're challenging death. I keep coming back to it, but for me, it's one of the greatest moments in music, if not the greatest. We'll see if I still feel that way in 30 years. But just the sound of wo, yeah. wo, wo ist ein Stock. I mean, the German language is so um, aggressive in that way. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, where, where, where? Where, where, singing just doesn't <laughs> work. It doesn't work. Vo, vo. There's so much more weight and intensity to it that for me, it, it loses, it loses that moment. So many of these moments are lost if yeah. we move it to something other than German. Well, you know, that's funny because I read that Brahms actually did approve of one, um, one translation. So that's what I wondered. But then uh, it's interesting you say that because I was listening to something last night that the, um, the T or something came at just the right point, just the right point as he was building this. No, I can't remember what it is, but as you're listening to it, when you go to the performance, pay attention to the consonances. Also, be super picky if you want to see if they're all fading at the same time. Ooh, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> because as a percussionist, this is so awful. But if I'm sitting with a choir and they come to a T and they say there are 60 people in the choir and there are at least 60 different times that the T arrives, a percussionist <laughs> Like, this is where we're supposed to play a note. Boom, right on the beat. But if all the T's are all around here, we're like, well, I don't know where to put it. <laughs> anyway, that's just a small. As you can imagine, a large part of choral rehearsals is where to put ending consonants. <laughs> <laughs> and in the same way that I sent the orchestra notes, asking them to read um, the text, you know, the chorus notes that they get oftentimes are T here, S here, T there, Z there, right? It is important. The consonants are part of the percussion. They're part of the, the musicality. They're part of, of what's going on. And so the first time I actually sang anything from Brahms Requiem was the fourth movement. I did sing it in English, and I sang it uh, at a Presbyterian church in Nashville. That was my first experience with it. And it was beautiful, and it was gorgeous. And just doing that movement alone as the anthem for a service, I think, was, was really, really special. Um, but again, I think part of my job and what I view my job is, is to bring um, quality art to our local Prescott audiences. And I think if you want the real experience of Brahms, you need to hear it in German. You know, we've provided the text and translation online. Uh, we've, we're we're going to have it available at the concert. And I do strongly encourage you to meditate with the words before you come, understanding uh, the amalgam of text. Two of the movements are from just one section of the Bible. Um, but if you really want this experience, if you want to get the most out of Brahms' Requiem, you need to experience it in the language that he wrote it. And that's why all the more important when we get to the vo, 
it works better in German than it does in English. And that's why I decided I think it's best if we present this in its most pure, you know, textual form as we can. Yes, well, yes, and that's one of the interesting things about Brahms is that the tippin is, yes, it's a percussion instrument, but it is really a, an extension of the basses. And it it's actually sings. I, I do har I'm, I'm responsible for harmony, I'm responsible for rhythm, I'm responsible for forward motion, and it sings. And that's the thing about Brahms. For voices, he understands that voices can be percussive, and they can be harmony, and they can be tone. It's just, um, it's just I, I, I just don't think I'm ever going to come to the bottom of all the layers of this. No. But that is one of the reasons why you'll notice Maria and the timpani will be situated between the bassoon, the double bass, and the basses of the choir, because they all have to work in tandem. Maria, I cannot wait to jump into rehearsals with yeah. you this weekend and to bring this, this iconic work to life here in Prescott. Thank you so much for geeking out uh, about Brahms with me today. Thank you, thank uh, you so much for bringing this forward. Yeah, absolutely. And we look forward to seeing all of you this weekend, uh, either in Prescott on Saturday at 3 p.m. or in Surprise at Vista Center for the Arts Sunday at 3 p.m. Join us for Brahms' iconic Requiem.